let me introduce you to an astronaut named Alvin. Imagine Alvin is on a spacewalk right now making repairs outside the space shuttle. His job is very technical, and as you can imagine, he's been extensively trained for a lot of situations. For example, if his tether were to break right now, he'd know exactly what to do and could use the thrusters on his spacesuit to make it back to the vehicle safely. But what would happen if he was further away from the vehicle? It might seem like he could just use his thrusters like before, but the answer actually isn't that simple. To understand why, we need to take a look at orbital mechanics. What is orbital mechanics? Well, the definition is pretty simple. It's just the study of how bodies can move in orbit. Everything in space is in some kind of orbit. For example, we know the planets in our solar system orbit around the sun, and all the satellites that provide us with weather, pictures, TV, and internet orbit around the Earth, along with the moon. It turns out that all of these orbits are kind of neatly defined with rules and formulae. Let's take a look at some of the basics. First off, objects stay in orbit because of gravity. You might know gravity as the force that pulls you back down to the ground when you jump, but it plays a key role in orbital mechanics as well. If there were no gravity, then an object flying past a body would keep going in a straight line. However, as it approaches a body with a significant gravitational force, the force of gravity pulls it into orbit around the body. Likewise, an object that's already in orbit is prevented from flying off by the force of gravity. In circular orbits, gravity acts as a centripetal force, meaning it's always pointing to the center of the circular orbit. In real life, however, not all orbits are perfect circles. In fact, most of them are what is known as an elliptical orbit. A set of rules called Kepler's laws do a pretty good job of describing elliptical orbits for the planets in our solar system. The first law states pretty much exactly what we've just covered. It says that all planets move in an elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus. What's a focus? Foci are a way of characterizing an ellipse. A circle has one focus, which is right at its center. If we put a pin on a piece of paper and tie a string to the pin, drawing with a pen tied to the other end of the string would yield a circle. In this case, the pin is a focus. This also works for ellipses, which have two foci. If we put two pins on the page, tied strings to both of them, and tied those strings to the pen, sweeping it out would give us an ellipse. I didn't really do a good job of drawing it here. The shape of the ellipse changes based on the distance between the two foci. Kepler's second law states that a planet will sweep out equal areas on its orbit in equal time. That means that if at one point in orbit, a planet goes from here to here, then that will take the same amount of time as the planet going from here to here, assuming that these two areas are the same. Practically speaking, this shows how planets move faster when they are closer to the sun. Kepler's third law states that the planet's period squared is proportional to the cube of the orbit's semi-major axis. The period is essentially how much time it takes for the planet to go around the sun. The semi-major axis is the longest distance between the planet's orbit and the sun. Kepler's third law makes sense to us, as we know that a year on other planets is longer when they are further away. All right, so we've seen a little bit about how objects behave once they're in orbit, but how do objects like satellites and spaceships get into orbit in the first place? There's a really cool and popular way of showing this, so bear with me if you've heard it before. Imagine you shoot an arrow off of a hill. The arrow will go straight for a bit and then slowly start to curve down until gravity pulls it down to the ground. If you shoot it higher and faster, it'll go even farther before it eventually falls back to the ground. And if you shoot it high enough and fast enough, it'll go so far that the surface of the Earth will actually curve away faster than gravity can make the arrow curve downwards to hit the ground. Now, the arrow will orbit around the Earth until it eventually slows down enough for Earth's gravity to pull it back to the ground. Just like we were saying earlier, there's some key characteristics that can describe an object's orbit. The eccentricity is a measure of how elliptical the orbit is. It's related to both the distance from the center to the foci and the distance from the center to the vertices. A circle has an eccentricity of zero, and the highest the eccentricity can be is one. These lengths on the ellipse are known as the major slash semi-major axis and the minor slash semi-minor axis. Perigee and apogee basically describe the points in the orbit where the satellite or moon or planet is closest and farthest respectively to the planet slash sun. Also, not everything orbits neatly in a 2D plane like this. Orbits are actually usually tilted like this, and there's a whole other set of parameters to describe this tilting very precisely. Of course, once you're in an orbit, you don't necessarily have to stay in that orbit. 
the path of an orbit can be changed based on the velocity of the object in orbit. When talking about changing in orbit, people use the term delta v to represent the change in velocity needed to perform certain orbital maneuvers. When you have a high delta v, that is, the velocity increases by a lot, the orbit will unfurl and stretch out. Likewise, when you decrease the velocity by a lot, the orbit compresses. However, each orbit will always pass through the point of initial burn. You can think of this as unfurling or compressing the orbit with the point of initial burn as the anchor. Let's take a look at an example, the Hohmann transfer. The Hohmann transfer is a low energy transfer between two orbits. It has three stages, the initial orbit, the elliptical transfer orbit, and the final orbit. This transfer can be used in both directions, so it doesn't matter which orbit is the higher or lower one. For the sake of this explanation, we'll assume that we're going from a lower orbit to a higher one. First, we will perform a pause grade burn, which is one that increases our speed in the direction that we are moving. Just for reference, a burn that decreases our speed in the direction that we are moving is called a retrograde burn. Anyway, our pause grade burn will stretch the circular orbit and put us into an elliptical orbit that is tangent to the final orbit. Then we can coast along the transfer orbit until we intersect with the higher orbit. At this point, we need to change our orbit again so that it's aligned with the higher orbit, or else we'll just keep going on the elliptical transfer orbit. We do another pause grade burn, which opens up our orbit to align with the high orbit, and we're done. To get back to the low orbit with the Hohmann transfer, we can do the exact same thing, but in reverse, so with retrograde burns. Now, why does any of this matter? Well, let's revisit our friend Alvin. Remember, we're talking about a situation in which Alvin would be far away from the vehicle and needing to get back to it using the thrusters on his spacesuit. If he tries to speed up to get back to the ship, he'd have a velocity change which results in a different orbit, meaning he'd no longer be in line with the spacecraft. So what should he do? Well, why don't we ask him? Hi, I'm astronaut Alvin Druid. I did a couple of spacewalks back when I was an active astronaut, and one of the things they did was train us on how to get back onto the space station if we became separated in orbit uh, by any reason. When you do things that look like they would be intuitive in regular inertial space, it doesn't get you the results you want. It will over a short distance. For example, I'm a short distance from the space station, and I thrust forward to get to the space station over maybe 10, 20 feet. That'll work. I'll get right back on. See, I get further back. I'm several, you know, dozen yards away, 30, 40 yards away from the space station or a spacecraft that's rocket out here, for example, and I want to get there this way. Okay, again, we're moving in the direction of orbit this way, and so I give a thrust out of my backfiring jet to go forward towards the spacecraft. What that does is that puts me at a higher speed than that rocket. It means I will drift up into a higher orbit. Once I'm in a higher orbit, over the dynamics is I'm going to orbit slower, which means I'll start to actually drift back and away. And if I do nothing but watch, I'll be in this kind of constant loop where I get tantalizingly close to the spacecraft and I keep doing the same thing again. Okay, so let's reset this and do it the way that you're trained to do this. You do what's called a plunge. You fire your up jets and then you go down. This puts you into a faster orbit. And so you will drift forward to the spacecraft. Again, you'll come up again at the front of this thing, at which point you can pitch over and grab the spacecraft and you're back on board. Okay, let's try this on the other side now. Say you're on the front of the spacecraft and you drift off towards the front. Okay, you can try and go back again towards the spacecraft, but now you're moving in a slower orbit, which means you'll go down like before, uh, and now you're in a lower orbit, which means you're gonna go orbit faster, which means you'll start to pull away from the spacecraft um, in the direction of travel. Once that happens, you'll come back up and you're back in that same weird loop again. Okay, so again, the way to get out of this one is to hop. Um, you sit there and you fire your down firing jets so that you go up, um, this puts you into a higher orbit where you'll fly slower. That higher orbit will eventually take you back down where you can latch onto the spacecraft uh, and get yourself back inside and explain why you fell off in the first place. I'm Alvin Drew. Good luck with your orbital dynamics. And there you have it. Of course, these ideas apply to all orbiting bodies, not just astronauts on a spacewalk. So maybe next time you feel the sun blazing down on a hot day or see the moon lighting up the sky on a clear night, you'll think about orbital mechanics.